Hello everyone, Ranger William here from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, bringing you another episode of Trail Talk, where we're diving into the stories behind the story of the Overmountain Victory Trail, trying to better understand the Overmountain settlements, the American frontier, and the Southern campaign of the Revolutionary War. Now, the summer leading up to the march of the Overmountain Men and the Kings Mountain Campaign, it was far from a quiet and peaceful time. Battles and skirmishes filled South Carolina's backcountry as British including those commanded by Patrick Ferguson, pushed through the interior of the state, chasing Patriot partisans and trying to secure British control. Now, one of the larger clashes to take place between these frontier forces was the Battle of Musgrove's Mill. Now, to tell us more about this battle, how it fits into our story, we're joined by Mark Stanford. Now, Mark is the interpretive ranger at uh, the Battle of Musgrove's Mill State Historic Site and where he's been the interpretive ranger there for just over two years. And prior to coming out here to South Carolina, he was actually in Charleston, Illinois, where he was a ranger at Lincoln Log Cabin State Historic Site. Now, one of Mark's favorite parts of the story to share with visitors is how the Southern campaign, like Musgrove Mill, was a story of divided loyalties, where you have people uh, who are Americans on both sides of the battle. So Mark, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So before we get too into the details about Musgrove's Mill, um, I like to kind of start out with just a little bit of kind of introductory information for those who aren't aware of maybe when and where we're talking about with this. Um, so to give us kind of like a base layer before we dive in a little more, can you tell us uh, when the Battle of Musgrove's Mill occurred, uh, where that site is located today? Uh, how we would know it, but also what that area would have been either used as or known as in 1780. Well, the Battle of Musgrove Mill occurred on August 19th, 1780. And uh, today, Battle of Musgrove Mill State Historic Site is located six miles outside of uh, Clinton, South Carolina, just off Highway 56. Now, in uh, 1780, most of the property of the park was owned by a man named uh, Edward Musgrove. Uh, that's where he gets the name from the battle and from the park. Uh, he owned the property here, a small farm, and also operated a grist mill here. And uh, another big thing about this area was uh, the main wagon road and the main ford across the Enery River was located right on his property. There's also several smaller fords upstream and downstream just nearby his property. Well, so that uh, really makes a lot of sense why you're ending up with a battle here then if you're not only dealing with uh, a landowner who has uh, these supply making institutions like a mill, but then also you have a main wagon road coming through. Um, now, Talking about where the site's located there near Clinton and also we got the old wagon road. Did that wagon road kind of, do we know kind of the route that the road took? Did it kind of follow I-26 as it cuts through there? A little bit. Uh, portions of the road followed what Highway 56 is today. A lot of it was buried underneath the road there when they built it. Uh, it's not 100% where the road exactly goes. It's hard to find maps exactly from 1780. There's later maps from the early 1800s. Uh, but most likely the roads had shifted slightly by then. Uh, we do know the road most likely went at least to 96. It's probably where it would go, where the people would use it to go. Yeah, okay. So that's kind of neat. If someone's wanting to do a nice little history road trip, I like to talk about how with the Oprah Mountain Victory National Historic Trail, we have the commemorative motor route. But then here you have these other sites being connected. Sounds like some kind of the, you know, the older state highways, Highway 56, kind of giving you that rough approximation of what the terrain, what the journey would have looked like 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so now that we know kind of where we're talking about, uh, that summer of 1780, the fighting in South Carolina, it saw Patriot forces from throughout the different Southern states coming to stop the British before they could push further up into the back country. Um, like for example, with the, the Overmountain men coming to the Battle of Mountain. But this wasn't their first time in the Carolinas. These over mountain men had been involved before. So can you tell us some of the, the notable Patriot leaders who you see kind of coming together for the fight at Musgroves? So the 200 Patriot militiamen that fought here at Musgrove Mill came from uh, three different states. Uh, there were men under a man named Colonel James Williams from South Carolina, and these were local men from the 96th district. Uh, also men from Georgia under the command of a man named Colonel Elijah Clark, and then the Overmountain men under Colonel Isaac Shelby. That's 
given for men from what then was considered Western North Carolina, but today we consider Tennessee. He's got some pretty big names right there. James Williams, who uh, later loses his life at Kings Mountain. Isaac Shelby, the guy who kind of uh, jump starts the whole over mountain men gathering for Kings Mountain. And then Elijah Clark. Um, if people aren't familiar with Clark, is a fascinating guy to study the whole war, how it happened in Georgia and his role. It's a, definitely a fascinating rabbit trail to get into. Um, so you've got guys from a, a wide area here from the, what's, you know, the Tennessee border down into Georgia and the Carolinas. Why are these guys getting together for this mission? Why do they think it's a good idea to come from all these different places and go to Musgrove's Mill and attack the forces there? So these 200 Patriot militiamen under the three colonels were part of a larger force of Patriot militiamen under the command of uh, North Carolina militia uh, Charles McDowell. Uh, he was operating along the North Carolina, South Carolina border area kind of shadowing Patrick Ferguson and his movement because he feared that he was going to eventually go north and invade into North Carolina. They weren't sure what they were going to do, so he was kind of hanging on the fringes of the border, uh, but also sending out raiding parties. So uh, Elijah Clark and Isaac Shelby earlier on in July had joined with him and been constantly sending out raiding parties, attacking isolated outposts, and also harassing Ferguson and his men. Now, before the Battle of Musgrove Mill, uh, they had learned that in the beginning of August, there was a temporary field hospital set up along the property. And also there was a temporary uh, Tory militia encampment here. Uh, the field hospital was set up for the wounded of the earlier battle, August 8th of, of 1780 at uh, Cedar Springs, uh, which Shelby and Clark were also involved in. Uh, McDowell had sent a scouting party out and they had saw the encampment and counted how many men and estimated around roughly 200 Tory militiamen there, plus the wounded, and most likely they saw other supplies and all things there. Mm -hmm. uh, so they decided it would be a good opportunity to do a quick raid. And McDowell asked for volunteers. Uh, Clark and Shelby volunteered. And also just before that, uh, James Williams had joined with the forces there because uh, he decided, and the men that followed him had just broken away from uh, Colonel Thomas Sumter and his Patriot militia forces. There's a disagreement over command and also where the, they should operate. Uh, Williams and his men that followed him were mostly from the 96 area and most of their families were there. So they had decided they were going to stay mostly around where Musgrove Mill was. And they wanted to stay there because they saw that as the biggest threat to their families and their property. Uh, Sumter was mostly uh, cooperating with the Continental Army around uh, the Camden area. So and then Williams and Sumter uh, would clash heads multiple times throughout the war about who should command the area's South Carolina militiamen. That's one of my favorite parts about these these militia partisan commanders to get into the, the kind of the weeds of their personal relationships, because like you were saying, they want to protect their homes. Uh, these yep. guys, they are wanting to put their homes first and seeing how many times Williams and Sumter or Williams and Sumter's other officers like Lacey and Hill uh, all through the Kings Mountain campaign, they're going to be kind of just going at each other. Um, but I think that makes it an even more uh, important point to realize here is when you have men like Shelby, like Clark, who are coming up and willing to help fight, even though that's not their home district, they see the threat. They see that unity kind of coming together. It's something really neat to look at. Um, so you've got this raiding party coming from Charles McDowell's camp on the, the North Carolina border, um, and they've scouted out, like you were saying, this field hospital. Um, can you tell us about that Loyalist force that was at Musgrove? Uh, do we know more about who their officers were? Like, What was the actual size of their force? Was that estimate of about 200, was that accurate? And also, what kind of guys were these? Because as Ferguson is moving through, he's gathering and he's training. He's trying to get this uh, really strong fighting force together. So were these militia, was that some of his well-trained guys? Or are these just new recruits from the farm? Well, it's hard to say exactly. There's very little documentation about the battle. And especially on the militia forces. And their, of course, militias didn't keep a huge amount of records. Uh, we do know some of the... Tory militiamen at Musgrove Mill was under the command of a Colonel Daniel Clary, who was uh, commanded local men, again, the 96th district is considered pretty much loyalist territory a lot of the times. Uh, he commanded the Dutch Fork Militia Regiment. 
And we know at the there's a record of his regiment a little bit before the battle, a couple months, and, and that record that lists about 100 men. Uh, again, that's hard to say is that's exactly the number that were here. Uh, James Williams and his report after the battle written just in September 1780, which is the closest document we have, he estimated the force as 200. Uh, so far, we can't find any more records about how many men were here, who commanded them, the Tory militiamen. Uh, we know for sure that it was Daniel Clary and maybe another loyalist regiment of militiamen. So we do, we're pretty sure that there's around 200 that were in the camp when they scouted it out, because most of the reports say that. Okay. If that makes sense. It's, I know it gets kind of confusing sometimes when we're... Well, just the way you've got all these kind of small groups going and coming and they're joining into camp and then they're being sent out. Um, but they, it, from what you're talking about, when they got their reports, when they got their uh, reconnaissance, that number was correct. So when they're heading out to raid this field hospital, this camp of 200, that was the plan. Um, but that kind of leads us into the next question that I have here. Um, we know from some other accounts of this battle that when they arrive there, um, it's a little bit of a different situation. Uh, it's not quite what they were expecting. And they have to kind of change their attack plan pretty quickly, come up with something new. Can you tell us about the, the, the battle plan that they came up with and how they tried to put this into action? So they arrived early in the morning of August 19th, 1780, uh, just about two miles north of the Inner River Ford. And across the river was where the encampment was. About that time, a local man came up to the three colonels and he reported that the night before, uh, at least 300 provincials and loyalist militiamen had marched in from the garrison at 96. Jeez. Uh, now, the, these men were actually on their way to join Patrick Ferguson in the back country. Uh, so they were just passing through and they probably just needed a safe place to camp the night. And there was just bad luck for the Patriots that they just arrived the, the day before they decided they were going to attack. Uh, and these men were uh, commanded by uh, Colonel Innes of the South Carolina Royalists. Uh, and he brought about 50 of his men from that regiment. He also had a small company of the 1st Battalion of Delancey's New, New York Brigade and a, 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 excuse me, a company of the 3rd Battalion New Jersey Volunteers. Now, again, it's hard to say how many men exactly he had. Uh, Williams, again, estimates about 200 provincials or what he calls British and 100 Tory militia. Now, usually in primary sources, when patriots say, British soldiers, they either mean provincials, which are professional soldiers in the red or green jackets, but are from the American colonies. Or usually when they say the British regulars, they usually use regulars when they say that most of the time. Again, sometimes it gets intermixed in documents. So when he was talking about the 200 British, most likely he's talking about those 200 provincials and then another 100 loyalist militiamen. Uh, again, it's kind of sketchy, so, so the documentation, how many men exactly. Uh, there's been some research done, but again, it's hard to nail down exactly. There's a lot of arguments one way or the other, but around 150 to 200 provincials, I would argue, and an extra 100 loyalist militiamen. So whatever plan they had has to go out the window now. I mean, if you're going to go up against this, this one force and now that's doubled and these provincials, I mean, again, like you're talking about, when they see those red coats, they're just calling them British but that is reflective of their supplies, their weapons, their training, their experience. These guys are a threat, so what's next? So the early plan of a quick raid across the river early in the morning uh, was thrown away. Uh, they had ridden about 40 miles the night before, so their horses were exhausted. So most likely if their horses were uh, not as tired as that and they saw those red jackets across the river, they probably would have done what most Patriot militiamen would have done got back on their horses and retreated to fight somewhere else. Uh, but since the horses were too tired, they decided they were going to stand and make a fight. Uh, reason they did this, because they had sent out a small patrol early in the morning and it had clashed with a Tory patrol near the river. So now the British forces on the other side of the river knew there was Patriots in the area. They didn't know exactly where they were, didn't know how many, but they're now alert. So again, ambush is no longer really an uh, ambush attack on the camp is never really an option anymore. Uh, so they fell back about two miles from the river into an open field. 
uh, what was described as an old Indian field. What that means exactly, it's hard to say. Uh, that's the only physical description anybody ever made of it. So it could have been an old field nobody was using. Could have been somebody, a field something was planted in, could have been open. All we know is open and cleared from trees. And on the edges, it was circled in by timber. And there's a slight slope up to a timbered ridge on the top with a road going through the middle of it. So they decided they're going to set up an ambush there and draw the British across the river to there. Uh, so they formed on top of the hill. In the center was uh, the South Carolina militiamen under James Williams. On the left flank was the Georgians under Elijah Clark. And on the right flank was Isaac Shelby and the Overmountain men. And they had the road going through the middle and on top of the timbered ridge. Uh, now there is an account from Isaac Shelby written after the war in the early 1800s uh, when he describes that they cut down trees and built a barricade across the road and a small breastwork. But most of the closer prior sources, nobody ever mentions that. And Williams actually reports in his official military reports that he ordered the men to take to the trees. That means most likely they hidden behind the trees. Uh, so it's kind of depends on who you want to believe and how far Back, you want to argue if there was a breastwork or not some people would say yes uh, most people today would kind of argue no enough that the trees was enough cover uh, but they set up their defensive line there in the tree line of the ridge and a man named captain uh, shadrach Inman from georgia came up with a plan him and about 20 men on horseback rode down to the river ford and began to fire at the british across the river uh, and that antagonized the commander lieutenant colonel alexander ennis to form up his men and cross the river to chase back Patriot forces. Uh, and he most likely brought all about 500 men, his 300 or 200 provincials, his 100 militiamen, probably another 200 militiamen from that were from the encampment at Musgrove Mill. Now, I do get a lot of questions about why would you bring all those men across to chase 20 men on horseback? Uh, I tell everybody, you got to remember, he does not know how many men are on the other side of the river. So it's a right. smart thing to do to take as many men as you can because there could be 500, it could be 1,000. Patriot militiamen plus the Continental Army is somewhere in the area. They haven't heard about Camden yet, uh, but they're still on the other side of the river. So taking all those men to chase those 200 or those 20 men on horseback is kind of a smart thing to do, because if you are ambushed, you have a force to stand and fight. Right, because like you were saying, too, um, I think I have a, a question later on that talks a little bit about Camden, how that battle happens before Musgrove's Mill, but they haven't heard about that yet. So you yeah. usually think about that in context of the Americans. Uh, they haven't heard about Camden, but you have to think the British too. They knew there was this a new American army under Gates coming down. They knew it was coming from North Carolina, but maybe these outposts don't exactly know what's going on yet with that force. So that's, that's an important part to remember. Now there are some characteristics that are gonna happen in the battle. Um, that are going to also be seen later at the Battle of Kings Mountain. Um, it's especially, you're looking at not only some of the same commanders are there, but some of the same militiamen. But you have accounts of Patriot rifle fire being terribly accurate at both of these battles, as well as the Yellen Boys. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, with the uh, rifle fire, uh, the British, when they were chasing Shadrach Inman and his horsemen up the road, uh, they got to the clearing about two miles north of the river, and they saw that there's men on top of the ridge there, so they formed three lines with the provincials in the center and flanked by the militia on both sides and began to advance up the hill. Uh, most accounts say they got with about 70 to 80 yards and the militiamen began to open fire. Uh, there's a exchange of fire back and forth for about 15 minutes. Most accounts agree with that. Uh, but the all accounts agree that the turning point of the battle was when Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Ennis was shot through the neck and through the thigh and fell off his horse wounded. And about that same time, five of the seven British officers were either killed or wounded almost at one volley from the Patriots. Wow. And that was the biggest turning point in the battle. At that point, the provincials broke in the center and began to flee back across to the river. Uh, and when the Tory militiamen saw the professionals running, they also broke and ran. So it was most likely that it was the American long rifles that allowed that accurate fire to take off all those officers almost in one volley and turned the tide of the battle almost pretty much instantly. Wow. Now, again, most of the militiamen probably had rifles. It's hard to say. Again, there's no records, but uh, I would say majority had rifles. Some probably had muskets or fouling pieces also, whatever they could get. 
Uh, but majority of the men probably had those hunting rifles since they had to bring their own weapons as militiamen. And the Continental government could not provide enough muskets, professional weapons to all of the militias. Right. Now, uh, with the yelling boys, uh, I believe that was a quote from uh, Captain DePuster. Yeah. Uh, again, it's also at King's Mountain when he says that. Uh, now, it's hard to say if this is the first time you ever heard that, but it's a good indication that most likely that was the first battle you heard that type of thing uh again it's hard to say who it was doing all the yelling uh most likely it was the over mountain men mimicking uh native american war cries but also the georgians and south carolina militiamen has also been fighting against majority of their lives against the cherokee also earlier on uh you probably heard that too and probably would mimic that also uh we have that quote on one of our waysides that we do on our uh, battlefield hike, and a lot of people ask me about what that means exactly. Uh, it's hard to, for modern people to understand the uh, fear that would bring into somebody. Uh, the hearing of the screams of uh, Native American warriors, again, most of these men on both sides probably would grow up all their lives hearing stories about Native American wars and battles and massacres, true or exaggerated. Uh, but they would hear that from young age and the idea would bring in those fears in the back of their minds uh even though they've never fought against native americans they would have heard those stories uh and then men that had fought against native americans had also experienced their bravery and seeing that in the open field they would mimic that many times throughout american history uh but it was that idea of the bogeyman coming that terror of not the unknown, the fear of hearing that and unknown what they knew what was going to come after that. The idea of attacks with tomahawks and knives and things, even real or exaggerated, again, it's that fear in the back of the mind. Uh, it's again hard for modern audiences to understand that exactly. Uh, kind of the closest thing I can ever think of is if you're in a crowded building and somebody yells fire, and again, it could be no fire whatsoever, you cannot see smoke or anything, but the idea that. that conjures up in your mind of being stuck in that building on fire causes that uncontrollable fear. Gets that, that kind of fight sense. or flight to kick in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. um, like you're saying too, uh, you're, this, the revolution begins only 15 years after the Anglo-Cherokee War. So, you know, the older men who are now officers in the militia maybe had fought against the Cherokee but definitely, if they're growing up in the Carolinas, Virginia, the Carolinas, they're hearing stories about this. Um, you've got the Cherokee campaigns in 1776 that a lot of these men were involved in, and they're kind of ad adapting this this tactic and kind of making it one of their trademarks. Uh, I'm trying to think it's uh, later in, I think it's 80, 81 or 82, uh, when Isaac Shelby brings some men back down into South Carolina and he threatens a British outpost. And he's like, well, you know who we are. We're these over mountain men. We'll tomahawk all of you if you don't surrender. And he bluffs this outpost into surrendering. Um, so a major psychological weapon there on top of this amazingly accurate aimed rifle fire. And like you said, around about a single volley, just decimating the loyalist leadership. And you can't blame the loyalist militiamen. Officers are gone. The provincials are breaking. I'm out of there too. I'm not going to stick around and try and clean up this mess. Um, so the result here is a patriot victory, right? Uh, do, do we have any? Uh, I know you said some of the information is a little touchy on this. Do we have information about the uh, the, the the casualties or the the size of the patriot victory? So yeah, again, the numbers are kind of vary between sources, but roughly between 60 to 70 of the British forces were killed and probably about 60 to 70 were captured. And another probably about 50 to 60 were wounded. Uh, on the Patriot side, we know that were four men were killed and nine wounded. It was a pretty lopsided victory. Uh, I would argue the biggest thing for that is the fact that the Patriots are on top of a hill and also behind trees. Uh, so that cover provided them a lot from the uh, fire from the enemy. And also men shooting uphill tend to have trouble hitting their targets sometimes if you're not trained to compensate for all the drop and everything. But again, that big thick tree in between you and the enemy is always a good thing. So Makes a bit of a difference there, yeah. Yeah. Um, so before we mentioned the Battle of Camden, and I want to kind of get into a little more detail about that now. Um, 
because this battle is taking place on the morning of the the, the 19th, correct? 19th, so. You, so you're looking at just three days after Lord Cornwallis's army destroys the Continentals at Camden. Um, just totally smashes Gates's grand army that he's marched down through Virginia and North Carolina. Um, and then just after that, you have Bannister Tarleton catching Thomas Sumter's militia at Fishing Creek and just, just scattering them there. Um, so you were looking at two big British victories, kind of more in the central Piedmont, and then this one Patriot victory here in the backcountry. Uh, so do we have any information about what the, uh, what the British reaction was? Um, to Musgrove's Mill, do we know, did they write anything talking about it, or did they change their plans? What are they going to do now that there's this little spark of Patriot hope in the, right in the way of their successful campaign? So yeah, there's a little bit of information uh, on that. Uh, commanders in the area uh, caused a kind of a quick panic. Uh, they just heard about the victory at Camden and Fishing Creek, so everybody was kind of elated on the British side. Everybody was celebrating the victory. Uh, many men thought that this was over. Uh, Cornwallis thought that was the last resistance. Thomas Sumter was the last Patriot commander in the area. At once he was capt or, uh, ambushed at Fishing Creek and his forces scattered, that was it. There was no one else in the area. Uh, now... Patrick Ferguson and his forces were about 50 miles away in near Winsboro. Uh, so there's actually letters and reports from him and also uh, one of the men that was under him, uh, Dr. Johnson, a lo the loyalist doctor, he wrote a uh, account in his diary. Uh, so there's a little bit of information about what they found out that day on August 19th. So they were forming up. They had just received orders from Cornwallis to continue the chase after Thomas Sumter and what remained of his forces that had scat been scattered by uh, Tarleton. So they were just forming up to begin their march to do that when a messenger arrived from uh, Colonel Ennis uh, begging for reinforcements and telling him about the defeat at Musgrove Mill and the fact that the uh, loyalist militiamen had abandoned him. He was wounded and he didn't know what was coming. Uh, so I got a quote here from uh, Dr. Johnson in his diary. Uh, so this is right after they got that report and they began to reform their march to go support Ennis and his men. Uh, it says, this to our great mortification altered the course of our march and at 11 at night we got into motion and marched all night. So this tells me they're, they're scrambling to get to where Ennis is because again they don't know how many patriots are there, what's going to come after, are they going to push on to attack 96 because uh, Ennis and his men were majority of the garrison at 96. So they pretty much stripped the garrison forces at 96 to help reinforce Patrick Ferguson and his men. Uh, Ferguson also wrote a letter to uh, Captain Ross, uh, Cornwallis's aide de camp, uh, and he misdated it July 19th instead of August 19th. So in his haste to write it. So this tells me he's scribbling this as fast as he can to get that information on the Cornwallis. Because again, by this point, Cornwallis doesn't even know that there's any Patriot forces in this area fighting back. Uh, again, I'll read another quote from his letter to Captain Ross of Cornwallis as a, uh, as uh, Sumter is certainly by this time several days marched from us and unless already overtaken by Colonel Tarleton and as the reason assigned in your later letter uh, for following him that there is no other enemy embodied and as Colonel Kruger writes that he had detached the principal part of his force along with Colonel Ennis it appeared to Colonel Turnbull as well as to every officer whom he advised with our duty to forgo the pleasanter service of pursuing the retreat of Sumter in the road, which has become a little serious both from this advantage and the intelligence received both by Colonel Turnbull and myself relative to a concerted rising of the rebels of Long King under Pickens. We marched this night for Lyles Ford in order either to receive Colonel Ennis if drove a second time or pre to prevent the march of the rebels towards 96. So again, this is confusion by the British command in the area. They don't know what's happening. Uh, they know there's Patriot forces. They don't know that, that in fact, that when they've heard that the defeat of Canada, that these Patriot forces have retreated back into North Carolina, uh, they think that they're going to push on after Ennis and attack the garrison at 96. Uh, and Ferguson is of the opinion that the area in the back country is not as subdued as Cornwallis thinks because he keeps there's earlier writings just before the battle that he keeps reporting that uh Andrew Pickens which is who has given his parole 
and is kind of working with the British to keep peace in the backcountry area of the Lines along the North or the South Carolina Georgia border area, kind of subdued and keep them from rising up with the Patriots. Uh, he keeps writing reports that there's rumors that Pickens has raised the militia and attack also. Uh, now, these are not accurate reports, but Ferguson, in his mind, he doesn't believe that the Patriots are subdued like Cornwallis does. Uh, and this kind of proves it to him that, again, it's this quick panic. You can tell by the writing and everything, and everything's kind of rushed. We're trying, we're going to go find Ennis. We don't know what's happening. We think they're going to attack 96. Uh, and again, with Cornwallis, there's this belief that after Thomas Sumter was the last remaining militia commander in the area. Uh, and once Tarleton had defeated him at Fishing Creek just the day before the Battle of Musgrove Mill, uh, that was it. There's no one else. Uh, so he has this misguided belief that once he can see his beaten, beaten gates at Camden and Tarleton has beaten Sumter, that there's no one to resist them. Uh, it seems like from his letters that he's the high command of the British Army is unaware of that 500 man force around uh, General McDowell around the North Carolina, South Carolina border. They're kind of operating in the area that nobody knows about. They all think they're part of Sumter's command. Uh, so again, there's another letter written uh, by Cornwallis to Lieutenant Colonel Kruger, who was commanded at 96 from August 24th, 1780, just five days after the battle. It kind of reinforces this idea uh, of this disbelief of the, there's actually patriots still fighting back. Uh, here's a short quote from there. Uh, this is again Cornwallis writing to Lieutenant Colonel Kruger. I received the favor of your letter with one from Colonel Ennis. I am very anxious to hear of Colonel Ennis, having been told that he is wounded. It is impossible that there can be any enemy openly in arms near the frontier after the total rout of Gates and Sumter. So this is five days after the battle, and Cornwallis still doesn't quite know what's going on. He's heard rumors of the defeat at Musgrove Mill. Uh, Ennis is wounded, but he doesn't know the details. Uh, and again, it's this disbelief. He believes that Sumter was the last remaining resistance, but these Patriot militiamen under Williams, uh, Clark, and Shelby kind of are disproving that. Man, so you there's a great source of information here from the British side. I love how Ferguson starts out his letter like, hey, you remember when we said this and then this and then this? Yeah, that's all wrong. We have to rethink yeah. everything now. Um and this kind of ties in just reading more about the British response, their reaction, their doubt about this frontier force being a threat. That leads right into my next question I had is um, why do you think Musgrove's Mill is so important to remember with the story of the Southern Campaign and the Kings Mountain Campaign? So I want to get your two cents on this. I believe the biggest thing was that morale boost after the major defeats at Camden and Fishing Creek. It did look like the war had been lost. Uh, those that was the Continental Army in the South had been defeated and been pushed out pretty much out of South Carolina. They had been killed, captured, or ran away. And then Thomas Sumter, the biggest commander in the backcountry of South Carolina militiamen, had been pretty much ambushed in his, in his pajamas by uh, Bannister Tarleton and chased out of his camp, and all his men had been either killed, captured, or scattered. His prisoners that he captured in an earlier raid had been released. All the supplies he had captured had been retaken by the British, and all his men had been either went home or had crossed over into North Carolina across the border into safety. Uh, and then on the heels of that, the victory at Musgrove Mill. Again, maybe not the greatest victory in the world, but it is a victory in the time when everything looks like it's going downhill for the Patriots. Uh, in fact, one of uh, William's officers, uh, Samuel Hammond, uh, summed up this best in a, his account after the war. He wrote that uh, the result of this little affair, talking about Musgrove Mill, was a clear speck in the horizon, which would have been otherwise very much overcast. And this little affair, trifling as it may seem, did much good in the general depression of that period. Our numbers continue to increase from that time and all seem to have more confidence in themselves. So again, it was that morale boost and idea of even though Continental Army was defeated. Sumter was defeated. There's still men out there fighting. Uh, I've also read a few uh, pension records of men saying, I heard about Musgrove Mill and I rejoined the militia to continue the fight. This idea of, hey, even though we're getting beat over here, these guys are still fighting back and we can still resist and can still hold our ground here. So it's this kind of that age old story about insurgencies and guerrilla warfare and rebellions you know, the rebellion does not have to 
defeat the enemy to win, the rebellion just has to survive. So here you have Musgrove Mill showing there's still an ember. There is still people willing to fight, able to win. And that's enough to keep keep men going, to keep them, like you just said, some of these guys come back into the fight after hearing about Musgrove's Mill. That's really interesting. Um, now, I had uh, another question prepared for you, but I want to skip that one. And because this ties in very well with my uh, my hypothetical, my what if question that I have for you. Um, looking at the hope this gave the Patriot cause, looking at this evidence that the backcountry is not yet defeated, my what if question for you is what if the Patriots, as they're coming down to Musgrove Mill, arriving at daybreak, what if they did not know the Loyalist force had increased? What if they went ahead with their plan to just charge into their camp for a quick raid? They find themselves terribly outnumbered against provincials and they're defeated. If Clark, Williams, and Shelby had just maybe not necessarily personally been killed or captured, their forces had just been scattered from the field at Musgrove Mill, how do you think that would have affected the, the campaign and the war? Again, it's hard to speculate for things, but again, it's a fun thing to do. Yeah, but, go for it. Uh, uh, I believe with so they were so outnumbered, especially with professional provincial soldiers there in the encampment, and the fact that their horses were so exhausted that they couldn't run away at the beginning and what really happened. Uh, so they would have dismounted and crossed the river to attack the camp and found that they'd been outnumbered and most likely majority of the force has been either killed or captured. Uh, it's my guess also the three colonels probably wouldn't, if they're, unless they got extremely lucky, would have been either killed or captured because he was, these were three men that led from the front. They were not leading from the back in most of the battles. Uh, so these are men always out in the front of the fight. So either most likely they've been either killed or captured. Uh, and in fact, taking those three colonels out, I think would have been a massive uh, change to history if that happened. Uh, again, it's hard to say if that happened, if the rest of history would have went the same. But again, with that defeat after the another major defeat after Camden and Fishing Creek and then Musgrove Mill, probably the morale of the country probably would have again plummeted. And it's hard to say if the men would be encouraged enough to rejoin the militias. And would there have been enough men to fight back at like Kings Mountain? Even if that had happened the same way and Major Patrick Ferguson had sent that letter across the Over Mountain, would there have been enough men to rally around to support that? Uh, they say, why would I go over the mountains? Shelby just did that and he got wiped out. So I need to stay here to protect my family. Uh, with Williams, it's hard to say if the local South Carolina militiamen, another major uh, South Carolina leader gets wiped out. Uh, they've been losing so many men. Sumter just been defeated. If Williams was just defeated, what would happen then? Uh, would the South Carolina militiamen fight back? Where they give their parole to the British, like Andrew Pickens and some of his men had done at Charleston? Uh, would they just surrender? Uh, would they stop the fight? Would they have that boost ever again to fight back? Uh, then with Elijah Clark, uh, again, he so he was instrumental in a lot of things happening throughout the South, especially in South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, but the fact that after Musgrove Mill, he led a failed attempt at taking Augusta in Georgia, and the fact that he was beaten there and he made the decision, a lot of the Georgian patriots made that decision to flee Georgia and go to the Over Mountain settlements, uh, which really was one of the boosting things that pushed Ferguson to chase after him and eventually get to his mountain. If he had not if he had been defeated at Musgrove Mill, would that have happened? It's hard to say. Would Ferguson have went into North Carolina? Would he have went west? Would he have rejoined with uh, Cornwallis? Uh, Another thing is, if Ennis had won there, would he have continued his march to join Patrick Ferguson and reinforced him with those provincial soldiers? Uh, would he then Ferguson have a much larger core of professional soldiers to rally the Loyalist militia around? That could have changed a lot of history there. Uh, and again, even if Kings Mountain happened again, uh, with all that and things turned out again, Elijah Clark again was instrumental in another major thing that people don't usually talk about too much with them. Uh, in November 1780 at the Battle of Blackstock, there was a major Patriot victory uh, between Thomas Sumter and his forces against Bannister Tarleton. He gave Bannister Tarleton one of his first defeats and uh, Elijah Clark and many Georgians were with him at that battle. Uh, after that victory there, Elijah Clark and many 
militiamen, some of the South Carolina militiamen went to the Long Canes settlements along the Georgia South Carolina border trying to raise support there. Uh, at the Battle of Long Canes there, uh, shortly after that, he was, they ran into a Tory and uh, forces that were looking for them and there was a short clash and Elijah Clark was actually wounded and most of the men had to scatter. Uh, during the search for the wounded Elijah Clark, the Tory militia commander uh, searched local houses, and one of those houses was the home of Andrew Pickens. Uh, and the fact that Andrew Pickens was not home, uh, his family was abused by the Tories and the British, and he decided that was the turning point when the British broke his parole. And the idea that they broke the violation of his parole, they were offering him protection, and they violated that, so that means he no longer had to not fight for the Patriot cause. And he rejoined the fight against the Patriots, and he was one of the leading militia and later on, throughout the rest of the war here in South Carolina, he was the, I would argue, probably the main one at that point after that. And without Elijah Carl Clark being there to do all that, uh, that probably wouldn't have happened. So again, it's those small things that, again, if one thing went wrong, maybe it wouldn't have happened, maybe it would have. So again, it's hard to speculate, but it's kind of fun to do it. No kidding, because, you know, when I first wrote that question, I was thinking, okay, Patriot morale victory is lost. The British have more encouragement. But when you get more into the weeds of it, like you're talking about frontline commanders, these guys. I mean, Williams is later going to be mortally wounded at Kings Mountain. Those kind of frontline guys. But if you just remove them in August of 80, it's like watching one of the Back to the Future movies. You start to just like pan forward and see, well, well, he caused this and that caused that and this caused this. If none of that ever happened, who knows what it would have been the, the situation. Um, so that was great. Thank you. Now I got one more question for you to kind of wrap up. Um, we've learned a lot about, uh, Musgrove's mill and its impact on the mountain campaign and the Southern campaign of the revolution. But if anyone's wanting to learn more, if they're wanting to dive in and get some more <clears throat> details, um, is there any kind of recommended sources or, um, what is there to kind of explore and see there at the battlefield? So there's a lot of good books about it. I picked out about four good good ones I think most people would like. Uh, one is The Backcountry Revolutionary, James Williams, uh, by William Graves. I don't know if you can see that very well with the thing. It's a little bit uh, higher. Though. There you go. Right there. Okay. All right. Uh, again, it's mostly a biography of James Williams, but Graves covers a lot about Musgrove Mill, and he also provides majority of the primary source documents that discuss the battle in the book. Nice. So you don't have to go searching for different places. It's all in either the footnotes or the back of the book. Uh, again, it's mostly about James Williams, so it only goes up to about Kings Mountain, of course, uh, where he was killed there. Uh, but it does cover the pre-campaign and covers quite a bit about Musgrove Mill. It goes quite a bit of detail about it. Again, but the biggest thing I like about this is those source documents that he provides in the book, which is a great thing for historians or anybody to really look through. Uh, another good book is Musgrove Mill Historic Site by Christine Swagger. Again, it's the only book written just about the battle here and a little bit about the site and the park and everything and the work to preserve the park. It's a good book. Uh, another good source of just about the Battle of Musgrove Mill is the Musgrove Mill State Historic Site Historic Resource Study, which was uh, written by uh, John Hyatt, who was a, is a South Carolina State Park Ranger. Uh, that was written when the park was first being developed in roughly 2003. Uh, so was, this was one of the main resources that was used to study the park. And that's available online, so for free. If you just search that title, again, the Musgrove Mill State Historic Site Resource Study, in any of the search terms like that, uh, that should pop up and you can usually download that for free. Uh, a good book about the wider picture is uh, John Buchanan's The Road to Guilford Courthouse. I always recommend that book there. Uh, again, it talks about Musgrove Mill, but also gives you the wider picture of things that are happening everywhere. Of course, the best place to learn about Musgrove Mill is if you come out to the Battle of Musgrove Mill State Historic Site. Uh, we do have a small museum here with a nice diorama that kind of gives an overview of the battle. It's an audio light show that just kind of shows you where all the lines were and everything. Uh, you can actually go walk our battlefield trail. It takes you through a portion of the battle field area and there's about 15 to 16 waysides explaining the history of the battle there also. So it's a good white, uh, hike through the woods and also you learn a lot there. Uh, that's a 1.5 mile hike altogether. 
Uh, we also have a smaller trail, a mile hike. It's called our British Camp Trail. It's on the Musgrove Mill side of the river uh, where our visitor center is. And it's a good mile loop along the Innery River. So you can, again, it's more of a nature walk, but it gives you a good idea of what the river looked like. It shows you where the river ford was and where the grist mill used to sit and gives you a little bit more history about the Musgrove family. Great. Uh, so, Mark, again, thank you so much for sharing all this information. Um, you've definitely shown some light on the Battle of Musgrove Mill and not only what happened in there and how it's such an interesting battle, but how this has major repercussions for not just the Kings Mountain campaign, but the rest of the Southern campaign, especially when we can try and uh, forget the outcome of the war and remember that when these things are happening, the people involved don't know what the result's going to be. Uh, so just how close things came to these massive British victories. Uh, so thank you again for talking with us. Thanks again for having me here. And thank you everyone for tuning in and watching. This has been another episode of Trail Talk, where we're trying to get to the stories behind the story of the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, talking with Ranger Mark from Musgrove Mill State Historic Site. So I hope you enjoyed it and tune in next time.